thought because lots of people have said when they see these uh, videos, like in Nottingham and like here last time, um, they've got no idea whether there's three or four sitting there or I'm doing it on my own. So I thought what a good idea might be is just to start showing that people are coming in greater numbers. So if everybody's okay with that, happy, I'm happy. Up, happy. I normally charge people for free time. Is that enough of a contract? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again for coming along to the Ashton meeting. Always welcome to come along every Wednesday evening we meet here. Always welcome here. Don't sit at home. Don't feel you're sitting at home and you're doing enough to the bottom of the street. There's thousands of us, you know. Please, please join in uh, every Wednesday, 8 o'clock, here. Uh, so, I'll hand over to Peter again. Thank you very much, Peter, for your time. Okay, that's yeah. it. Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for coming today. Uh, an amazing number, and the, the meetings are growing all the time. Uh, right, so, what I'd like to do just before I begin is to give people a, a very brief overview um, of sort of where we've come to date, or to date, and just to explain some of the things that have, uh, have happened to date. Um, we started the first uh, run on the checkbooks around about, I think it was April the 13th. So, we're not far now after, uh, coming up to us for the second month and we're still going and it's getting stronger. The number of people that are joining at the moment, it's averaging probably around 65 people a day that are coming on. Uh, two weeks ago that was 45 to 50, so it's creeping up steadily. The thing that's holding us up at the moment is that before there was a lot of activity from overseas because people could not only join, but they could pay. And there does seem to be a very, very strong link in this for some reason. Um, that people do actually want to contribute. So with the power, uh, sorry, with the pay point sort of saga uh, playing out as it as it did, uh, a lot of people are, uh, I think, being frustrated in places like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and the United States because they just can't join, and so there's a little bit of uh, you know drop off for that. So at the moment, um, the people who are coming on board, around about 70% are coming from the UK. Um, Canada then probably makes up another 5 to 10 percent and then the rest is from other places around the, the globe. Uh, the, the idea was that after the, um, the saga with uh, uh, PayPal, who still have not uh, allowed us access to the account and won't even allow us to make refunds, uh, is that um, we had to look for another platform, or to try and look for another platform so people could pay, uh, so that we could start to, or join, so we could actually start expanding the, the base and the, the facilities that we were offering. So we looked at a, an organization, uh, in, uh, it's an Indian organization originally, uh, operating also in Canada, uh, and that was called Paytronics. Um, it didn't work out because we actually found that one of their, uh, their organizations, I think, who'd been dealing with them, had actually been closed down, I think, through a dispute with Visa or whatever. So the problem is we didn't really want to be jumping out of the frying pan into the fire and then in a few weeks' time being, being able to say to everybody, well, hey, you know, the same thing's happened again. So what we had to do is to start looking to alternative means and alternative ways of, of funding us. So. When we, when we were at the, the Nottingham meeting last time, um, what we did is, for those people who wanted to join there and then, we offered a facility where, whereby we pass envelopes around, and on the envelopes they had to put on, so just in case people want to do that again today here, uh, they had to put their name, uh, their email, their address, um, and also, what they're actually wanting. Is it a £10 membership on a monthly basis? Is it two £10 in for two months membership? Or is it for the checkbook and a month's membership or whatever combination that might be? So if everybody's reasonably clear on that, that's for the people at the meetings. So what we're trying to do then is have more meetings because the integrity of the meeting is the key that the, the elite no longer want to have us doing. 
And this is why we're living in quite a disconnected society where it's very easy to make contributions via PayPal. It's very good to f like things on Facebook. But the only thing that's going to change anything is people getting off their backsides, coming together, and the whole ideology behind We Are Bank was always to re restore, restore the, the fabric or the glue of society which held us all together. And that only comes with shaking people's hands, sitting next to them, um, getting into difficulties collectively, but sorting them out collectively too. Uh, otherwise, where we're heading for very quickly, and you might have seen it on one of the most recent um, uh, Alex Jones broadcasts, but he was a, a, quite a reliable um, economist that he was talking to. I think his name, uh, Harry Dent. And he's talking about the collapse in the, the United States Treasury short-term market and also what's called the 10-year market, where the money, the returns on these bonds now are hysterically at almost at zero. Uh, they used to be at a premium of around 2 to 4%. And that also ties in with the fact that the, the global banking elite have recently had this meeting in London, and it's for the, the next phase of the New World Order agenda, which is a cashless society. So for those who haven't heard before, uh, I think in Denmark from 2016, the retailers have the option of opting out and not accepting cash. And then in Europe, uh, provisionally from beginning of 2018, maybe January, then only small denominational bills will be accepted for things like ice cream, bread, uh, maybe giving to someone, I don't know, on the street. So that's why we've got this, this uh, what do they call it, this system now, uh, proximity pay. Yeah, with your cards, you don't even have to put it in now. It doesn't do the dial-up. It gets you <coughs> real quick because it isn't dialing in. It's simply clearing it and they'll come for the money if you go into debit later. So this is really what the, the, the focus of today is. Um, and it was a, it's a very important meeting, this one, because it's the first time uh, I've been able to bring some of the ideas that I had originally in 2012 and bring them up to date here. And they're coming to the fore now because, in my opinion, uh, we're drastically running out of time. And so the message has always been we need to get these groups going in Birmingham and in Nottingham and here in Aston and in Liverpool and in Manchester and then down the south and north of the border, wherever we can get them going. Um, and so this is very critical after the meeting today. If you want, you can suggest having a meeting. So instead of these people coming up from London or some people came from Southport recently, then you just get the meeting focused in an venue and then I'll come down and then we'll grow it from there because we've got to get these hubs up and running. We've, all, we've got a commitment for, from the group here. We've got some people in Liverpool who are creating it now. And it's, it's a real dynamic because what you are, to me, is my protection. Because without you, this doesn't go anywhere with me. Because lots of people are saying, oh, I'm surprised it's still going. And I hear you've been arrested again. And there's all these... You know, the, the Metropolitan Police and the Fraud Squad are looking at it, and well, they can, uh, but I've said consistently, the last place they want me is in a court of law talking about this. So, you know, there's various things that we can, we can do if they try and push it to that level, but what we'll have them doing is systematically dismantling their entire edifice of their fin financial, commercial, criminal structure in front of whoever's there, otherwise they're going to have to have it as a trial in secret and, you know, we are then very much into, um, you know, uh, a Stalinist sort of uh, dictatorship whereby there is no rule. There is actually no rule of law anyway. Uh, for all the people who know here, you just go and stand in a court. It doesn't matter whether you had Jesus, Gandhi and Buddha there as your defence. They'll just ignore it. They'll steamroller it through. And at the end of the day, everybody's standing around and saying, well, why didn't he even listen? So the, the constitutional background here it is not government now by consent. 
It's an electoral or a, 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 a democratic, well not a democratic, it's an electoral dictatorship that you've been scooped up in where the semblance of a democratic vote then gets lost in the cabinet office. The cabinet office makes the rules. The cabinet office is not a constitutionally recognized organism. It's somewhere where Cameron sits with 12 nights of sort of a round table making collective commercial decisions that affect your life. Um, so people say, oh, well, if you don't vote, it doesn't get you anywhere. If you do vote, it doesn't get you anywhere. But equally, they're, 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 they're laughing up their cuffs at you because these decisions are made by a small coterie of individuals and constitutionally, they have no weight over you because if you look at what a definition of statute law was in Black's dictionary or any dictionaries prior to probably 1970 or 80, it will say that a statute is primarily there uh, and allowed to run uh, with the consent of the people. So if you haven't consented to it, then you should object to it. And all this confetti of statutory instruments you know, for parking and bylaws and the, the cameras which regulate you to 50 miles an hour as average speed. It's not constitutional and it's not an act of parliament. And what we've got to start doing is bringing that message to the fore with everybody we deal with. And the only way we can do this really is making these groups bigger. Because with big comes acknowledgement. If they stay at these numbers, then it will be a nice memory that, you know, we were, all, we were involved in that in 2015 and what a shame that one didn't work as well. So the only way we can move this is by you, every time, wherever these meetings are, um, put your egos in your pocket or your pride, but drag someone along. And if the message isn't good, it will just die on the, you know, the fruit will die on the tree. But the very fact that these numbers are coming together are different than every meeting that I can see off for, for, for many years around because people are traveling in from quite considerable distances just to be there. There's the next meeting on the 20th in Birmingham. Uh, already there's around about 100, 120 provisionally uh, booked in for there. So uh, what I'm saying is it's a time to be excited and to get excited. And so now what I'm going to do, having covered that, is uh, the road ahead. I'm not going to touch on all the stuff I've usually covered before in these lengthy two and a half, three hour videos, which the video editors are, are very <coughs> glad for me not to be doing. Because now I'm going, to, I've, I've said all of that, and you know, nobody's going to come to these meetings and hear the same thing twice, apart from the consistent drumbeat that we are running out of time. That's not a fear generator. That's not to say uh, you need to panic, but you need to be intelligent. You need to be discerning. You need to stop listening to what's being, uh, should we say, force-fed onto you. Look at all the stuff that's coming from the media and dismiss it wholeheartedly. And then start thinking, right, do any of these things that we're talking about make sense? And if they do, well, let's go with it because I promise I'm not some sort of uh, bizarre Pied Piper leading you into a life of ruination. Um, what's out there is not what you want and where we want to go together is hopefully where we go. So uh, we won't touch on any of these other general subjects, but the, 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 the title today, Free Movement uh, and We're Bank, The Road Ahead. Um, so... What does the road ahead, because it's such a warm day, we'll take a few minutes break, and that'll give us time then to set up the, the projector, and then we'll, we'll go again. So uh, that's a good cue, because someone's phone's just gone off. So we'll just take a very short break now, and then we'll be back right after this. Okay, so to resume, uh, someone has just asked a question about um, he's received a, a checkbook and his wife uh, has applied or hasn't received her checkbook. Can he sign a check on her behalf or can she take the check and sign it? Um, 
No, it's only the, 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 the check numbers are listed against the person that actually applied and joined. And so if that comes through on the system and the check number is always quoted, and then we see a different name against it, then we would have to say, well, excuse me, we need to look into that. So then that causes a bit of a, 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 a repercussions along the... Okay, you know, please. The clearing. So, uh, on that topic now, we'll, and we'll clear up some of this uh, before we get on to the, the presentation uh, main, I'm going to try and go through this in about 40 minutes. So just so that you know, usually these, these presentations have a, a habit of me going on too long, so I'm going to start cutting it down and making it a lot more uh, intricate. But it's going to get a little technical because without the technicals in it, then this is just a bit of a, you know, a bit of a waltz around the park and the, uh, the powers that might be looking at it will think it's all just, uh, you know, it's all just a fantasy of somebody's uh, deranged imagination. Uh, let's address the fact that certain people are having checks returned to them by public utilities companies, um, Virgin Media, Sky, uh, a district council, whether it's Wigan District Council or South End District Council. Uh, are there any people here in that? I'm sure there's one or two. Yeah, okay. So, not so many. Right. Uh, however, it, it is happening and it does happen. It does happen. Um, so, if you go onto the frequently asked questions section, on uh, wearebank.com, you'll actually see us addressing some of these points. Some of them, for example, uh, it's a rubber check, um, the bank isn't legitimate, um, it's not incorporated, it's not regulated by the FSA, etc., etc. The big one on the legitimacy is you actually have to look at what various judges have said in the past and what the nature of banking is. Even the Bills of Exchange Act defines it as an organization incorporated or not that is in the business of doing certain things. And if you do these certain things, you are deemed to be banking. There's even cases where uh, the so-called law lords in the past have adjudicated that small enterprises who were not in the nature of banking were engaged in banking. So as far as that argument is concerned, it's for us to be defining banking, not for some teleclerk sitting on a nice swivel chair in uh, you know, HSBC's head office saying what it is and what it isn't. If they want to argue the toss on that, then we can argue that in a court of law, okay? Because it's a very, it's a very salient point. The next thing is, uh, the account number. I had uh, Cambridge Magistrates Court on the phone on Friday. They were concerned about the account number. It's a series of eights. Yes, it is. It's a trust account. So if you've got any questions on the, the nature of that, it's a series of eights because it's an account number for all of you. And you're all in a club. And in effect, what you've done with your £10 a month, you've created your own bank. Yeah. yeah. So all we've done is facilitated that, and then opened up a slight, instead of a um, you know a, a two-dimensional uh, game of tennis between the 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 plaintiff's barrister, the judge, and you, we've actually done something and said right. Well, let's put another party in. We'll create a triangle, and so now what we've done is immediately energetically distanced you from the confrontation with them. So your protection then is in the realm of what do I have here? What is the nature of commerce? What's the nature of a promise? And is it legal? Look up and start to learn and educate yourself. What is the definition of money? Yeah? Oh, now they say for some of the council, sorry, we only take credit card. We won't take share, we won't take cash, we won't take gold or silver, we won't take share certificates, they'll take nothing. Next they'll be telling you to pay in pineapples, or blood, or whatever else suits them. And so, this is the problem. This is where it's going. The cashless society that they want is 
no consultation from you, yeah? The so-called democracy of all democracies, the mother of democracy here, no consultation, know whether you want it or not, it's continuously forced down your gagging throat and it's got to stop. And you are the people who are going to stop it. So I can help you and show you the way, but we have to do it together. And as I said before, before the break, you are my protection. So all I'm bringing to you now is, is an idea. And it's something I'm going to touch on now because if you look at the world we live in, we live in a world of ideas. It's nothing more. And it's all been made up on the hoof and it's all been changed as we go along. Except you're not the ones changing it. You're there in a very, very passive role with this social engineering and eugenics um, masquerade of for your safety and security wound around you as you know the net gets tighter, your liberties become fewer, and eventually when the catch drops, you know, we're all going to be on the wrong side of the wrong room. So apart from that, um, I don't really have too much of an opinion on it. Uh, and so now what we're going to do is to move on. No, just before we do that, we haven't, I haven't finished what I was going to cover. This is for all the people who say the banks um, have ostracized us and not communicating with us. Here on National Westminster Bank letterhead from the manager High Street in Egham is a chef <coughs> of ours. Okay, for the benefit of the audience. And it's for 1093 spot 64. And they've had the presence of mind to not bother what UK Clearing says, not to bother what CCC, that's the, the check and card clearing company says. They've actually sent it through to us for clearing. Now, I can't, yeah, the, the, and the, but there's lots of examples of this. So, what we have here is to the manager of Weir Bank. Okay? It's come from the manager of NatWest Bank, Egham. Sorry about this, pal, if you lose your job, come and work for us. <laughs> 50, 50 High Street. It's got advice of a special presentation check. This is what you should, if any of these so called payees say it's been bounced back by their bank because the sort code's not recognized. Well, of course it's not recognized because we're not involved in their criminal, mafia, monarchical country club. We're outside of it. And when they say it's not a legitimate bank, they've got that damn right. Because the legitimate banks are involved in money laundering, funding wars of aggression, genocide, funding all military operations around the planet, funding the drug cartels, because with everyone that's doing the paying, somebody's got to be doing the buying, and what are they saying? It isn't going through the banks. So for every shell that hits a wall in Palestine, or every shell from a Kalashnikov that tumbles onto the ground in Rwanda with some child's head blown open, those fat asses of the people sitting in those high street <laughs> banks telling you that you can't do this when they're actively propping up an organization involved in criminal acts, genocide, war of aggression, torture, etc., etc. They need it sort of gently bringing home to them because this is quite passionate and it's very serious. Yep? Okay. So. So here we have uh, the drawer, that's the name on the check. We have the individual who's then got the check number. We have a sort code on it. We have an address. It came to us, wasn't so difficult, came in the post. Um, it says the amount being under 500,000, do this with it, or the amount being, uh, sorry, over, so either under 500,000 or below. This is what you need to do. It's got a signature on it which is quite good, and then it's got the instructions of what they want us to do with it. Um, so if you can't do it any of these ways,
then they've even put a bank gyro credit on the bottom <laughs> for us to do that. And if you look at some of the things that like Wesley Ahmed has done with paying British gas with a bank gyro credit, or what it means when you put a signature on it, in effect what they've done is they've sent you a check. Yes. Okay, so that's just to let you know that. And that's not, I brought one along because I could have brought many, but NatWest's a good one. Another one, another one here. Uh, from Sedgemore in Somerset, Finance, Property and Exchequer Team. Again, copy of the check with the allonge, with instructions how to pay. It's got Weir Bank stamp on it, says Weir Bank received, funds cleared. Okay, another one here, Hewlett Packard from Crawley, requires immediate action. Check on the back, instructing us how they want it to be paid. Um, for our international friends out there, various checks come in. From this one's from Scotia Bank in in Hamilton. I think that's Ontario. So again, instructions with the check on how to pay it. And these are coming in under what's called advice of a special presentation. So these people in Canada have had to keep pushing and arguing. No, you're obliged to clear it. And they've come back and made all sorts of excuses. No, we can only accept um, Canadian currency from a Canadian bank. Don't. Go and look at what it actually says in the international treaties. So you have to man up a little bit with these people who are saying, sorry, no, we're not going to clear it. If they are making accusations against Weir Bank, if they're making accusations that the, the, the checks are fraudulent or the account number doesn't exist or uh, you're in danger of in being involved in a scam, then volunteer to help them get you to expose it. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> And, and, and why we look at that is it's an old trick of tort. Laws of tort, of trespass, um, and various other tortuous actions from the 16th and 17th century particularly. And what the rationale is, is as follows. If that individual is claiming a particular state of affairs, and you then become the plaintiff, the idea is you call him as a witness for you. If he refuses, he then has to be put as a witness for us because he can't have it both ways. Yeah? And if he refuses, and he has what's called a reasonable degree of knowledge within his, his station, then it looks like perversion of the course of justice or he's deliberately fogging the issue. So this is why we're trying to do this. If they're making these accusations, fine. Three or four lines explaining why. And lots of lies are coming that they try to present it, but we've turned it down. Just for the record, the phone only gets answered by one person, that's me. There's no one else turning it down, there's no one else answering it after seven o'clock at night. Good cue. <laughs> <laughs> Might be for me! It's not my phone, by the way. So, um, so that's a, it's a point here that will we'll come on more and more as we step through this, that these people who are telling you the way it is are just low-level uh, counter staff who are, are paid to just do whatever and the main thing is they need to be put on the spot and made to realize what they're actually protecting, what they're upholding and the, the sheer criminality and the degree of deceit within these, you know, these, these moth-ridden fossil structures that have been keeping us in this state of war forevermore. So this takes us on now to the very next pertinent point is war. Because this is the agenda of this planet and always has been. War is the norm. That's where the bankers make the money and historically always have. And they fund both sides of the conflict and the agreement is that whoever is the victor picks up the bill for the reconstruction. Okay, so that's the deal. That's how they play it. That's how they never lose. And so when these, you know, uh, dictators or these individuals are coming to power and they need money to fund everything, 
Who pays for the bullets? Who clears, who, who, who clears the checks? That is your beautiful send it by swift, or backs, or chaps. That's what they are. Illegal money laundering rat runs, electronically set up, so these creeps can hide all their financial dealings for the Hillary Clintons and the, the Bushes and the Blairs and the Camerons under the carpet where no one can see it. Yeah, and then they expect us to play games with them as well. But that's the, the thing. So that's why we're out of their operational circle. That's why we're not involved with UK Clearing. That's why we're not involved with any of these country club organizations like the private company of the Bank of England or the FSA or Prudential Regulatory Authority, whatever the damn they call themselves now. Um, we're just not involved in it because we don't do it their way. We do it differently. Right, so here. What we've got here, we're going to look at certain things now within the, the, the compass of, of Weir Bank, which is all based around the potential, and I think quite real situation, that very soon you're going to be in a cashless society and you're always going to be in danger of having the, the, the carpet taken from under your feet. Because if they don't like who you're associating with, or the meetings you're coming or going to, then next thing you know, your internet link is, uh, is switched off, your credit card's sort of limited to 150 a month for food, etc. And don't think they won't do it, because if you join the dots from where we've come, and you project it into the future, you don't really have to be, you know, terribly clued up to see where they want to take it. So until you actually see some type of regime change there, and that means people like Cameron out of the way, um, people like Obama out of the way, um, Hollande in France, Merkel in Germany, until you see some change there, then it's the agenda as it is, and they're very confident that they're going to be able to push it through. So. What we've looked here at, something in the past, we see um, this price stability here. 1717 to 1914, the price of gold remained static. Sir Isaac Newton, who was the master of the Royal Mint, set the price in 1717 at three pounds, 17 shillings and 10 pence. And I can see most of you in here remember actually that type of currency. Okay, so what we had is, that's for one troy ounce, and it stayed that price from 1717 to about, nine, actually a bit further than 1914, but in principle, over just about 200 years, where if you'd have gone back in time with an ounce of gold in your pocket, you could have lived in 1717 and before as easily as you could after. How could that happen? for 200 years and more, and then the Federal Reserve Act 1913 comes in, and bang, we have a war, which propels us into a cycle now of economic and social and spiritual and moral collapse that we probably even not, never really came out of. It was a shock. So price stability not good, Lies in freight, inflation, interest, taxation are all sold to you as being part of the business cycle. But they're not. They're manufactured in rooms by senior economists for bankers who tell you uh, uh, that's the way it is and it's free play of market forces. It's not because it's evidenced by the fact that when things get very dodgy in 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 global economic uh, theatres of war, prices of, the, of gold usually go up because it's a safe haven. It doesn't happen. The stock markets are all time high and it's completely disconnected, probably from about, around about 2000, I would say. So the devaluation of the money supply keeps you as a rat on the wheel and you've got to keep earning more because if you try and retire at 50 with what you calculated as being enough, 15 years later, you find out a cup of coffee is now 100 quid, and you're in trouble. The quantitative easing fiasco is basically counterfeiting currency. All this money they're pumping in, in the United States it was 30 billion, now over here in Europe it's uh, 
It's 1.2 trillion over the next year and a half by the European Central Bank. So credit is this thing called negative capacitance. It's an electrical thing. And how they, how they spark it or free it off is invariably through, through war. So that's just a run on this. So devaluation of wealth. I'm only covering this generally today because it's something that is going to is going to be quite important in a moment. 1717, the population of the UK was around about 9.6 million, and that's England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. The little sub numbers just there. You see these bits here. 1717, the price of gold at £3.17 and 10. Today, the 64 million in, and we've had a seven-fold increase. So it's around about 725 a troy ounce. Okay? So, yeah, it's a bit sort of heavy here, but there's this thing called gross domestic product, GDP, per capita, UK in 1717 was around about six pounds sixty or six point six pounds equivalent to one point seven ounces of gold. Today we've got a GDP per capita in the UK of about twenty five thousand. Okay? But equals to about thirty five ounces. So there's a two thousand percent increase on those figures. That one divide by 3.5 ounce minus 1.7 ounce, divide by 1.7, gives about a 2,000% increase. So, therefore, we've got here, 35 divided by 1.7, so, so the current <coughs> value of an ounce of gold, if it was based on this GDP, should be around 15,000 a troy ounce. Now, lots of people in the, we've got to be, Carefully, because lots of people are on this gold bug thing, and people talk about silver and gold, and what's it's worth, and who's suppressing it, and how much really is that. But we're just equating this here, that these points here are factual, you see? This, this cost here, for 200 years, was maintainable. And that was included in, through the Industrial Revolution. So all the people who say, ah, well, it's different now because we've got technology now and we've got Audis and we've got planes and we fly all around the world. Look at the biggest expansion of any country, the British Empire, through a time of industrial revolution, through the uh, 1800s, 1850, 1860, even into, say, 90, uh, 1895 when Tesla uh, invented, well, <coughs> discovered his... Uh, is ACDC system for electrification. Phenomenal. And gold stayed the same. If you want to go in and look at historical prices on almost anything, uh, oil and bread and orange juice, it was all fairly constant. So all I'm trying to make you realize is the trick that they pulled over is a big trick and it doesn't have to be like that. But it serves them to have you believe it has to be like that. Okay, so where does it lead us? So, we've had over 300 years, a 186-fold increase in the price of gold, and seven times a population increase. So, so what, we're, what we're looking at is the structure now for Weir Bank as it's going to go forward. As everybody knows, we have some fundamental aspects to it. We've got the... the unit of currency, which is the re, which is pegged to time, and we also have the promissory note, which is the world that we are trying to sort of detach ourselves from. And the reason that the promissory notes are based in sterling and in re is that we've got two currencies stepping or going complementarily down the road together. But, so, the key to this financial stability is one re, that's one re, or it could be one dollar, or one pound, 
but backed by something of value. And this is always historically what it was. It was either backed by silver, it was backed by gold, it was backed by a combination. And this is where the ruling elite, when they collapse the market, before they get onto these things called SDRs or special drawing rights, which is just more ways of magicking up money, they're looking for a gold-backed currency to convince all of you to, to probably subscribe or buy into. Because when the confetti is no longer, uh, should we say, worth anything, or when they've collapsed it, they want to take you maybe down that road. So, planetary collateral reserves and this prepaid treasury. This is like where all the, the elite's store is. There's two different accounting systems, really. There's the one that the world seems to present to you, and a bit like in The Matrix when uh, Morpheus speaks to Neo, then there's what's actually behind the scene and how, how reality for them really is. The gold price is pegged to protect the elite from two main areas of attack. So what we're looking at here is can we use gold as a means of protecting you and everyone else that comes in over, over time. So physical gold is invariably what's called 99.9% .9 pure. The translation of this from the old into the new is always historically, it's the size of what you could carry was probably the limiting factor of commerce. You either had to go down to dust, you know, to have tiny particles, or you had to have a particle sufficient size that it was probably handleable, okay? Because they didn't have plastics, they didn't have the paper technology, and what we're looking at here is, is there anything we can do with modern goal, with technology and time, to sort out this coin size problem, okay? So the ideas from the past could maybe float us today. So if the price of gold, and we can show it, so it doesn't really matter what the official version out there in Orwellian speak is, it's what we can see that it used to be at and what it possibly is projected at now. So what that would involve is a revaluation. So imagine somebody getting a balloon and weighting it down with concrete on the bottom of the seabed what we're coming along and doing is cutting the, the cord and allowing it to refloat. Okay, so it's it's commonly spoken about. Currencies have this done with them regularly, in the inverse as well. For example, in the 80s, the Italians devalued their currency, the lira, because it was into the fact that you were using hundreds of thousands of lira just to buy a loaf of bread. Same has happened in Germany in the 1920s. So. This price of gold here, the New York Stock Exchange, or Metals Exchange, is priced on infinite supply and futures contracts with no physical delivery. So when people quote you the price of gold, that's just based on that. If you have enough money and want to try and take physical delivery, then you have to go to the London Bullion Exchange and seek it there. And you'll find it isn't available. It's available in smaller amounts, but if you went into any meaningful amounts, then you'll find it's not available because you want physical delivery. And everyone that's really talked about gold in the past, and is there any people here who, who've read any of the forums of, of gold bugs and things like this? Anyone followed it? Maybe? Yeah? Shout out. Yeah. Don't be shy. Okay. And what they've all come a cropper on, a bit like Bitcoin, it being electronic, uh, it got closed down for a while, the FBI sees the Bitcoins, or uh, with Kitco, um, a gold trading organization, they volunteer to look after the gold for you, or you don't take physical delivery yourself, and then, you know, they get accused of not paying VAT on it, or whatever the, 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 the scam is, and it all ends up causing very bad press. But what we are what we're looking at here now is this thing here 
the principle of a, of a dollar or a re or anything. What does it mean? Can people read that at the back? Okay. So what, and this is written by a guy called Carl Denninger who writes for, um, he, he runs a site called Market Ticker in the US. One of the best, best commenta commentators on what's called capital markets. Indulge me while I just read it. One dollar of capital is simply the principle that nobody be permitted to create credit out of thin air, thus artificially expanding the spendable supply of money in the system. This and only this is the reason for all the bubbles and financial collapses throughout history. This sleight of hand is why tulip mania in 1637 happened. It's why we had the crash in 1873, 1929. It's why the tech market blew in 2000. And it's why we had a crash in 2008 in the housing market. It's why we're threatened with a collapse in Europe right now. It's a scam as old as the money changes during the time of Harun Mabi. And until we stop it, there will never be stability in the banking or financial system. The sleight of hand is in fact exactly identical in mathematical and economic impact to counterfeiting of the nation's currency. So don't let them point at you. You're not counterfeiting. You've actually done what every sane and morally obligated individual would do. You create a promise to do something and with the value of that promise engage in spending it down with everything that requires for you to repay it. But what they've done is completely sold you on the idea that they're lending you something when they're not. And the moment you sign, as I keep repeatedly saying, this uh, Q1 2014 Bank of England report states that the moment the individual or the bank creates the loan, it creates a simultaneous deposit in the hands of the borrower. So what they're trying to do now is they're trying to make the clown car without the wheels go down the road forever by saying, well, you don't need money before you create a loan. You just create it and then that's there. The only problem with that is you're on the wrong end of the mathematics. You've got to do the paying of it back. So it's very easy for them to hit the keys, but what that then does is provide you with a lifetime of, of financial slavery and energy theft where you've got to pay it back. So, just to finish them up, a crime which we all should recognize, condemn, and when it occurs, the punishment should include both imprisonment and forfeiture of every dollar of ill-gotten gain. How are we doing for time, by the way? Can someone tell me? What I'd like to cover now is this, uh, this realm of ideas. Because everything in the world is an idea. Yeah? The idea of someone making this chair. The idea of uh, Steve Jobs with his Apple computers. The idea of how we do our buildings, how we educate our children, the internet laws, how we elect our governments, how we educate our children. It's all ideas. Okay? And ideas only increase by being given away. So, if I've got a joke, a funny joke, and I give it to you, and then you give it away because you think it's a real funny joke, it increases because more people take up on it. This idea that we're running with now, the idea of We're Bank, um, it's an idea, nothing more. And we can create it and move it and cut it however we wish. And if the idea is attractive, other minds take it up, and we increase with it. And what we've got to do is we've got to get to critical mass. And critical mass in this population of 64 million isn't 30 million. It's probably not even a million. If we could get 10,000 people on board with this who were seriously committed to it, and it's not difficult because what we're offering is the keys to the cage and a way out and don't forget for every check that's turned down and at the moment God there's probably 15,000 out there that's 15,000 units of work energy that someone's got to argue 
the toss against you, or if they want and you insist, you've got to end up in a magistrate's court with. So can you imagine, yeah? So there are many functions behind we a bank. Some of them are genuinely based on the fact of the legitimacy of the promissory note and who you are and restoring some of your sovereignty. But equally, there are other agendas within it which are, are like sort of like little um, exploding toys that are going off in these banks and in the courtrooms and wherever for a considerable period of time. We could actually probably formulate that we've already got there, you know, we've already, we've done what we needed to do because I maintain that the genie is already out the bottle. Because once this is running and once people can see what can be done <laughs> and the fact that checks do get cleared by some and other times, well, I don't know, they're too lazy to, to get in touch or they just blatantly lie and say they've got in touch with us and we've refused to clear them. So they're lies. And it's up to you people out there and the people on the video watching to actually start putting pressure on them to prove that they're lying. Yeah? Because this is where it needs to go. And so what you've all been given is, you know, people say the pen is mightier than the sword. We don't want, uh, we don't want people on the street. We don't want people smashing windows. We don't need any aggression against the police. We just do it with a pen. But we stick with it. And when they come back and say, it's not valid, well, you justify why it's not valid, and these are the points of why it is. Okay, so that's where we need to keep taking it. Right. This is a proposal. Now, I've spoken with some people at Get Out of Debt, and I've spoken with one or two other people in and around. Um, some people think this, this sort of cashless society is going to come sooner rather than later. I think inevitably, the way it's going, uh, with local council saying, you know, they won't take checks now, or checks are dangerous. Yeah, they'll only take they'll only take a credit card. So what happens if you haven't got a credit card? You have to go to your local uh, bank and have to fill in a lot of forms now, almost to take out cash. Or well, there's a limit to how much you can take, or you've got to give them notice. And soon there won't be because the limits in Europe are coming down. And even now, to cross borders in Europe, if you're taking more than 10,000 euros, you have to declare it through customs. Or it's liable to be confiscated. So, so we need to get back to this, this community of, of dealing with, with ourselves in a way that's got some meaning. And the mindset of disconnection is a disconnection from everything. So it's a bovine sort of dumbing down of the population so that you just unwittingly almost just accept everything and nothing really has a price anymore. So this is really what I'm saying here, that the idea that I'm bringing here today is just an idea and it's always a two-way street with an idea. I can give that to you, or we can work it together, but it's whether it makes sense as to whether it works or not. So, and this is also really designed so that people understand it's organic. There's a lot of thinking gone into it. We do have very, very concerned members of the establishment that are hoping it works. Yeah, so that's all I can say. Plus, I have to keep maintaining that the only thing that's going to get you through this is a, an, an identification with an energy force that's not only encoded in the cube sphere on the, on the weir bank. Yeah, everybody seen it? Everybody knows what it stands for? How many people don't know? Everyone. Okay. Uh, there are two main components of this, and they're very, very ancient. And we're using the technology, or should we say, <coughs> the magic that the other side have systematically used in the past to weave a web of, around you and keep you in a state of, uh, I don't know, or, almost like hypnotrance. So, the cube and the sphere represent 
great spirit or consciousness or God or mind of Buddha, whatever your idea of a, a central unifying force is, but in space and time. So the dark cube represents the infinite expansion of coal black space and the circle, the absolute compression into white hot suns of matter. So it represents the in-breath and the out-breath of everything in the universe. Because you breathe, the atoms vibrate, <coughs> the birds breathe, the planet breathes, the trees breathe, the universe is expanding and we're told eventually one day it's going to contract in on itself, maybe. But that's the fact. So that's what it represents. God, so if it's doable, then we have a God product on every single thing that we touch. So that's what the battle's about. You could say it's biblical, or you could say it's as old as time itself. And for those who've got a spiritual or a, a religious bent, you could say this is, this is a, a way of finding out who you are. And for those who are atheistic or agnostic, but it doesn't really matter, it's just nice symbols and it might work. So that's for that. So the next part then is the the re-symbol itself, which is, who knows what that is? Hands up for anyone who, who knows or doesn't know what the R and the E on the website, you know, or on the... Okay, so these are, these are um, runes. Okay. Has anybody heard of runes? Okay, the expression, you've been ruined, comes from uh, ruining. So, this is what we're trying to do, or will be doing, to them. Runes have historically been used by Charlemagne the Great, who became emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 800, vanquished all his foes. The Holy Roman Empire was built around um, the use of so-called mythological energies, um, from Charlemagne through the Knights of the Holy Grail, right the way back through the Essene Brotherhood, which Jesus was uh, involved with, etc. So the Gnostic sects and all of this. So what we've actually got here is two runes combined. The one that looks like the R is the fifth rune called Rido, and that symbolizes uh, the nature of cycles and the turning and the reward for work well done. So that's a cyclical revolutionary one. And then the little leg that's put on it represents a rune called Tiawaz, which is the 16th rune. And it symbolizes uh, Tuesday, Tiawaz day. And Tiawaz was one of the, the pantheon of, uh, of gods with Odin and uh, uh, Ingawas and people have sort of some mythological stuff recently. Loki, one of them in these things. And uh, what, what he did, Tia was, it's a room of supreme victory or sacrifice. And so he sacrificed his hand into the wolf of, the mouth of the wolf called Fenris to allow the gods to, to escape. So it's a bind rune. Bind runes, Nokia, Nokia phone. Have a look at the K on Nokia. You'll see that the sixth rune, Kenaz, sorry, sixth rune, Kenaz, is not attached to the upright. Also Bluetooth, 18th rune, Bicano, also used there. So they use a lot of these, this ideology or symbology. Okay, so that's really just to cover the tools we are bringing to what we're doing. This isn't some harebrained fantasy that's just come out of someone's kitchen after he'd had too many Stellas. It's been thought out hard and long, and these, these symbols and these objects, plus... What everything is that's behind it has been brought down to try and help you and me get out of this insane asylum that we're all locked in, which becomes more insane by the day, you know? So what we're looking at here then 
these are the specifics on what I'm calling this route map or road ahead that we need to, to look at. So, we've got to act now. We've got to start doing something now, and this is why these meetings are so important. And I thank everybody that's come over these distances today. People from Birmingham, and people come up from London, and people come from Yorkshire, all over the place. And this is what we've got to do. I made a prediction. As long as you can support me, before the end of the year, they'll be in football stadia, and we'll have 60,000 in the stadium. And nobody will be telling us... And nobody will be telling us we can and can't use the stadium or whatever the regulations are. We will be a serious, contentious force. And I made these declarations in 2012 and 2013 on YouTube. Then 2013, on the anniversary of when England was handed over to the Pope, uh, to a, 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 the papal legate called Pandolf, that I was taking it back on behalf of the people. So what we're doing is we're polarizing the country. It's called a polarity principle. So you've got to now invoke what's called catalyst. Otherwise people will never make a decision. So you're either with it or you're against it. If you're against it, that's fine, but we can see then who you are. Yeah. So this is why this campaign is going to run out and we're going to be doing an identifying mark, the re logo, which you can put into your car sticker, uh, your car windscreen, <laughs> take the tax discs off, and they're going in where the tax disc used to be. We're going to have them on windows, we're going to have them everywhere that we can possibly. So we're marching it forward, it's going to be streetwear. And why we're doing this is for simple reasons. I know what the energetic charge of the symbol is. You will too on various levels. Some on a conscious level, some on a subconscious level, some on a, well, I don't know, I just turned up because he asked me. But what we've got to get away from is getting into this argumentative, this is the statue, I'm at the side of the road, the cop's got the bat on, I've got nothing, he wants to do whatever he wants to do to me, or you're discussing something in a courtroom. You don't have to say anything. We just wanted, so when they see who you are or what's representing you, they immediately understand, oh right, okay, I can see where this is not going today. So we don't want to get into making it too difficult for you, not to make you all economists, or you don't have to know about the banking regulations, it's the fact that you're within a, a, a brotherhood, or in South America, in, they call it Hermandad, or Hermandad. So it's like a collective. So it's a union. It's, a, it's getting back to how it was. Because from the time all the unions were broken up, the fact now you've got zero hours work contracts, they can sack you, you can't do anything about it. You're really just now um, more of a slave than you were in even ancient Rome. So. These are the specifics. So, acting now, stopping everything and joining. I mean, in a way, I don't care what you join. It's just that we've got this idea, so let's go with this and see where it takes us. A membership drive to try and get people on. And it isn't for making money, and it's not for me to buy a canary-colored Porsche and go and live off somewhere. Um, the promissory notes aren't being sold to the Chinese. Various people know where they are. So, it's all being looked after and taken care of on domestic soil. The main ingredients though, the promissory notes and the checking facility are the holy ground. Those are the things that will pin you to a success within this, as long as you become a little bit more aware and a bit more savvy of the arguments. But as it goes on, uh, in the frequently answered questions, all the questions that are there, there's a section going to be created soon on the website for the banks. So the banks will be able to go in, look and see that the, the checks have been uploaded and have been cleared and then it's up to them whether they take the money or not. And I said repeatedly to them, we are the banker's prayer, you should be very happy we came along because only by us bringing this extra 
uh, energy or money clearing facility in, can you clear your debt book and carry on moving? And I think, obviously, at some level, they're not that, well, they're not stupid because they've been running this, uh, this game for a long time. So, what we're looking at is the, the unit, or RE, we're going to recategorize it. Because at the moment, the big thing that's holding it back is it's, it's a mind-based unit based on time. So, people who are working and crediting on their accounts, the, the time-based element, are going, okay, well, fine, I've done that now, but where, where can I actually go and spend it? So, up until we get the numbers up, and what we're doing is we're also going to put a map on the website so you can actually see the concentrations of people in your area, so you can, you can tag up with them. But the next thing is, we've got a lot of people out there which are outside the sphere of influence. So it's okay you say, well, I'm quite happy to try this re as a spending unit. But that painter there, he won't do the job for me because though he might do the painting for free or for re, he needs to buy the paint. And he's got to go out and buy that from someone else. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to create the equivalent of a Swiss franc. So, uh, I don't know, I, people, I've always, there's always been a history of the Swiss franc being quite a, an acceptable form of currency, and in times of, of economic and currency meltdown, it's always a refuge for people to go and buy Swiss francs. Why? Because they, they believe that the Swiss government will endure, it's a neutral country, and it's where the elite stash all their stolen goods. That's why it's allowed to survive. So, script just means something that's written. Yeah? So I've always said, or said before, that we weren't a bank involved in script. Yeah? Because, you know, look at the amount of currency you have to have printing presses the size of the Bank of England and the mint turning the, turning the wheels for the amounts that would be required. So, but what we're going to do is, we're going to do it in a, a more limited way. This isn't going to happen next week, or the week after, but it could be in a very, very short period of time, because we've got the technicians working on it now, and it's something that I was involved in in 2010. I mentioned it before, Global Settlement Foundation. We're trying to bring a gold-backed unit of currency into Africa. And one of the main proponents was Muammar Gaddafi, with the uh, um, organization of African unity. And this, uh, this is what the idea was, that they were going to make a fast run for it and bring in this, this gold-backed unit. So there's a difference between gold-backed, which could be any variable percentage of gold, or it can be the next thing then, carrying the coin. So what we're looking at is charging a note, but not using coin because notes are a lot more appealing. So we're going to also create a currency war. So there's a currency war already on, on the planet at the moment between the dollar, the euro, the ruble, <coughs> the renminbi, the yuan. And so they're battling all this out now between them to find out who the heads of the mafia-type Zionist cabal are going to be who finally are in charge of the new world currency and they'll be proposing various alternatives but what we're going to do is we're going to have our own internal one a two-tier so there's everything that the re unit of time was before how you earned it but now also there is going to be a gold backed unit if this finds um, sufficient approval from the people. Okay, so what this involves is the club revaluing the price of gold. Okay, so we unilaterally, as the group, look at the price historically and look at what we think 
would be a reasonable level it should have been at now, but based on these historical facts, remember right, it stayed for over 200 years at the same rate. If we actually floated it up now, you would find that if we look at an eightfold revaluation of where it is now, and that's reasonably conservative, we come in at these figures, around about six grand, so six thousand. So what we're looking to do then is create, well, the dollar is supposedly the uh, reserve currency, a global reserve currency. So what we're going to do is create our own reserve currency, and the reason for it is to give it absolute bomb-proof spendability no matter what happens outside. So this is the key now. This is the key and what all this is sort of leading up to. A unique initiative to uh, embrace new but ancient teachings. Okay? So there's lots of information, there's lots of knowledge out there that we've all been searching for and there's lots of suppression and virtually every single thing that you could imagine that, you, that we take as being the truth is not. We've all been systematically sort of uh, lied to and steered away from the truth. So this is the, the idea, right? Instead of, we could say, for example, that you don't care what you pay the monthly subscription in over, over the year. So if we had it quarterly, yeah, 10 pounds over three, four times three is 12. So 120 over the year, however you want to cut it, okay? So then what we look to do is to say, right, this is how we like to receive it. And you don't really care. We could say, right, we want a pair of Nike trainers sent in a box, or we want a suit sent in a box, or we want fruit sent. Because you're taking your 10 pounds a month or 30 pounds over the three months and just doing something with it anyway. So what we are going to do is we'll say, this is how we like to be paid. And you'll say, okay, that's nothing to me. 30 quid times four times a year is coming out my pocket anyway. What do I care what I do with it, right? So we, though, do something for you that comes in here. So it's a call to arms, it's emergency action, and it's the first group that this has been uh, <coughs> floated in front of, and equally, just making sure of time here, um, it hasn't been covered anywhere else. This is, a, this is not a new idea, but it only has come out by the fact that we are under this uh, this attack from the banking community that if we just stay in the realm of the checking account we're not going to be able to expand it because they're coming along and saying oh it's not valid and we can't trade with what's called people outside the zone or what you say the circle of trust so what we'll do is the gram of gold at the moment is about 27 pounds for a gram Okay, and so the moment you throw it over to us by the factor of eight, it goes to 216 a gram. Okay, that's just that us yeah. unilaterally revaluing it and saying this is what the price of gold is. Historically, uh, in 1933, the Gold Confiscation Act by Roosevelt, they confiscated all the gold in the United States. I think it was then at something like 29 an ounce. That's what it was on the Friday. And on the Monday, when the market opened, they jumped it up to 33 and made a phenomenal amount of money for the United States Treasury. Read the CIA and the banking uh, organizations behind it. So. What we've got then is we a bank creates the script or the note and the notes become infused with the gold. So has anybody got um, a 10 pounds on them or a 20? 
Okay. Right. Just a ten. So there's. If anyone one's got them, you've got. Yeah. This, this is a ten. You see this little? There's like a little silver thing there, and all those are are. If you actually look at it in the right light, you'll see there's like a little plastic thing around it, and they're put in under heat and pressure and welded onto the node. Okay. Equally, when you turn them over, there's that little uh, the line that weaves back and forth. So the principle behind infusing the notes will be threefold. The moment the one gram arrives, it's eight times the price in our club as it is outside. So you can see what it might want to do to people outside who want to secure currency. They'll want it. Yeah, I hope. Okay. They'll, they'll want it more than they'll want anything else. And just in case I forget. And why they'll want it is because for the first time since we were taken off the gold standard in 1931, it won't be exchangeable for gold. It will actually be. So, the process now with the technology is to do what up until now wasn't doable, and that is either using um, oh, big B. flake, um, gold leaf, or gold flake. Here you go. Yes! Gold leaf or gold flake into the note, or the next part, and we haven't we haven't worked out exactly at the moment the the solution. Actually, literally, is we take micro particles, not nanoparticles, micro particles of gold. We put them in the solution with the paper, and then dry the papers out, therefore the particles become infused in the note, and then the finishing treatment. Uh, anyone been to Australia or New Zealand in the last few years and seen their, their notes? You can go to the beach with them, you can put them in a washing machine. Yeah, so it's like, it's, it's like a plastic and it's really durable. Now, depending on which way we go, either with the little seal, impregnated in, or the weave through, or the lettering going through the note, that will be a designated amount of point something something of a gram of 99% pure gold infused into the note. So the actual, the actual carrying mechanism becomes the value in itself. There's no question about being gold backed, there's no argument about it's a coin. The only question then is the two points. Um, in fact, the main one is really, ah, but what's to stop somebody cheating me on it? With a coin, the big problem in the old days was what's called clipping. Yeah? Someone had shaved the coin. Or they could counterfeit it by producing something like, I don't know, a lead plug, coating it over and this is why you used to have this touchstone thing, you know, you'd get some gold and you'd rub it on and put some acid on. But you don't need this with the integrity of the product because it'll be, anal for the retailer or for people generally, it's very easy to do. And just like, you know, when you go into the, uh, the supermarket or the book bookies or wherever you go, if you get a high denomination note, or sometimes not even, they'll put it in the light and it'll show that it's a, it's a valid note. Well, they can do that in, with various very cheap ways of what's called spec, spectroscopy for the actual note. So that's where that's going then. So the next part then is the re as a unit of time. How do we marry that up? So it becomes now that we had, and this is the proposal, before we had this unit, which was 12 re, per hour of work, which was equated to about 24 pounds. Yeah? So we've looked at that now, or I've looked at that and thought, right, well, if we take a re 
tiny unit, so one is R-E-T and one's R-E-G, yeah? If we link the one re in gold to the one re in time, it comes in at about 15, 15 pounds for one. The idea is the time one is paid at two an hour. Therefore, for an eight hour day, 16 re, 240 for a day's work in gold. Yeah, real, real money, Whoa. not artificial, okay? So it's fair, it's equitable, available, radical. The IMF, World Bank, European Central Bank, the Fed, the Bank of England are all planning a gold-backed currency contingency. They've got it. Now, here's why we are doing it like this. I keep saying we. Um, what they would say to us, and it's a typical argument, we've got the gun, but we ain't got no bullets to fire. Yeah? So this is the argument with all of you. Yeah? You've got the idea. Yeah? But where's your gold? Yeah? You can't... So this is why the time unit was, in, it, it was introduced. It cuts us completely away. But for the interim period, while we've got probably, let's hope, a 30-month run at it, We'll use our intelligence and our commitment. The new technology will translate this old, fuddy-duddy, gold-backed nonsense. Because I'm not, I'm not a gold bug. I'm not a great lover of it. But if it gets us to where we need to go, and we can create, with the technology, a gold-backed unit, which isn't coins jangling in your pocket and you're having to worry too much about, yeah, we can have them in reasonably... Uh, well, very easily um, carryable sizes. They're tamper-proof because you'd have to be a lunatic to try and get the particles out of it or the, the infusion out of it because by the time you'd finished flicking at it and scratching it and ripping it, it would be all over the place. And why bother? Yeah? And equally, why bother? Because somebody might say, well, why, you know, you could just burn it, the notes, and you then collect the gold and but why would you bother you still got to carry it around anywhere or then make sure that you're making it into a bigger and bigger piece so why not just keep it in the note as it is and that's it so the idea is while you've still got time we're on the titanic yeah but this is in the ballroom when we're just setting float from was it liverpool and we're all happy and we're all going right but someone has said to you oh white star line maybe they want this thing uh, sending to the bottom of the sea and so i'm saying that's what's going to happen and you're all going to go oh don't be crazy don't be stupid you can't <coughs> sink this so what i'm trying to say is this is our 30 month window at no cost to you other than the fact you're in the room now and you like the idea of the checkbook or the checking facility and the idea of the movement. So as long as it still all rings true, then we've got more ideas and it's ideas that they haven't even thought of. So the, uh, the plan therefore is we take the unit of currency while we can, we create our own gold back unit to run simultaneously with the time unit and what will hopefully happen is they'll seamlessly interlink because the utopian future is you just get rid of the gold backed anything. Because, to be quite honest, it's a bit for a planet that's evolving, it's all a little bit, you know, king's crown and gold here and gold round the neck. If we could get away from that, we could run on the time based. But until we do, We've got to have this sort of, um, you could call it an IOU, International Outreach Unit, whereby what well, we can go to people and say, all right, yeah, all right, yeah, okay, you don't want to have that, but what about, what about a few of these? What's that? Oh, yeah, that looks very nice. What's in it? Gold. Get out. And it will, it will sweep through the country as the only way forward 
for people who want to protect themselves because then um, we don't have to worry so much about so many numbers joining. What we're doing is what will compensate for the numbers are the revaluation of the currency, uh, of, the, of the gold price into the fact we've got an easily transportable unit of currency. So I think that <coughs> is that apart from the advice, so join re-movement. If you haven't got an envelope, take one. Please write your name, email address, and account number legibly. The re-movement, the joining fee, it's 35 one month plus the setup fee to include the checkbooks. The checkbooks are coming down to 25 in number from 50 just because of the sheer numbers we've got to go out at the moment. So when and you want more checks, then you can come along and, and uh, have them. Uh, name and account number will now, not from now, but within the next month, you'll have your name and your account number printed on your checks. So that gives extra security for you, and it also addresses the, the good question from the chat gentleman before about can I, you know, can I pay my wife's, uh, I don't know, whatever it was. So we're trying to make it just so we've got this, this more of a personalized link for you, and it makes it a little bit safer for you because you've actually got your own name and your account number on it. Uh, thereafter, this is the proposal. Well, isn't yet. Membership, 120 per annum or 30 quarterly, payable in gold, delivered to Weir Bank. And one of the things I'd like to mention uh, is the fact that uh, I've been brought up always to believe that um, cash shouldn't be sent through the post. Yeah? But I was speaking to someone at the Royal Mail the other week, and they said, no, that's not the case. Um, Actively, people do, and if you wish to, then you use this <coughs> yeah, plastic, first class. You've put anything in it of value. Up to 100 grams, it's insured up to 500 pounds. And evidently, it's outside, uh, it's outside the private jur jurisdiction of Royal Mail. <coughs> it comes under... UPU, evidently, whatever that means. So that's the thing to use. So for people who then are joining from, uh, from you, the idea is, as you have to send your promissory note, you might as well put it in there and also put your contribution in. And cash isn't a problem for the moment because uh, until we can, and I can't see us ever doing it, by the way, now, uh, the funds have got to come in either through the post or they've got to come in through meetings. And the good thing is, as we get bigger, it won't be so important. But until that point comes, uh, we have to stretch out and do this. And while we'll make it easier is we want lots of hubs or, uh, you know, um, there's going to be this one here, there's one in Liverpool, there's going to be uh, one down the south, there's one already in Birmingham. And so we need more and more, and therefore you don't have to travel such great distances. Uh, we've also then, just before I forget, yes, I know there's so many ideas, what we're also now working at the same time as the note is we'll have the charge card. So you'll have your own card, and that will be charged up with re-units, which we spoke about before, and you'll be able to spend those in retail establishments. Um, the retailer end won't need to be connected up by a dial-up like it is now, but he'll have a download every morning, and he'll have an upload in the evening onto the box. It's a bit like uh, if you travel on the trains, yeah? Uh, and you, you haven't paid your ticket, you have to pay your ticket. They're not connected up to the terminal. They've just got a, a, a list of uh, unacceptable cards for the day. And if your card doesn't process, they go on the phone and try and clear it. So the idea will be then, we'll open it up to retailers, and that then brings in the spending ability for you to go in 
and they won't know or care whether you're spending gold-backed or time-backed because it'll be charged with re. So, is that reasonably clear? Okay, right. So, that's about it for now. And what I'm going to do is just have a, a drink of water and then I'll we'll start with some questions. Thank, can I just say thank you very much to you for doing this, making it all look so good. Thank you very much. So, let's start with uh, some questions. Uh, quite a few have been asked already, but let's, let's carry on now. So, uh, yeah, that lady at the back there. Can you know who's doing gay, please? Are you advising that we ask for a redemption to pay off the or pay by check as a monthly instead of direct debit? No, if you're going to... If you're going to uh, look to pay off the mortgage, two things you need to consider. For some people, what's happening is when you're asking for a redemption figure um, and then who to make the check payable to, they're saying to make it payable to yourself, to your own mortgage account, supposedly. Uh, but the stupidity of that or the, the craziness of that is that if it's yourself you're going to be paying, why would you actually be calling it in ever on what to pay it in the first place? So I would suggest that if it's they that have asked or given you the loan, then it's them you should be paying. So also, uh, on the monthly amounts, if the check system works, and it does, whether they allow it to or whatever dust they kick up, uh, then there's no point in going for it piecemeal, paying it monthly, because they can just mess you or dick you about monthly. So if you're going to pay it, pay it in one, and then you walk free. Okay, and then this gentleman here yeah, is just... Yeah, could something to that? I used to work in banking, and I, I know that they could easily accept a cheque made payable to themselves or the mortgage account, or themselves read the mortgage account. And the reason why you, they tell customers to put their own name on it is in case the cheque goes missing and they need to know who to apply it to. So you can easily just write down Lloyd's Bank or Halifax and right. so not a problem. Okay. You take it either Thank way. you. That's a very good point because when you actually uh, look at the Bills of Exchange Act and the United Nations Convention, the uh, United Nations Convention 1988, which refers to Bills of Exchange promissory notes, um, I think there's one part of that UN Convention says this does not apply to checks which is a point. However, when you actually look at the draft legislation, you see that everyone that was discussing that before that piece of legislation was passed, saying it should refer to checks, because they, they hypothesized that if it didn't apply to checks, then what you were opening up is what's called a, a two-tier um, Bills of Exchange Act. Yeah? So it either is a promissory note, check, negotiable instrument, letter of credit, etc., or it isn't. So, um, in many cases, it doesn't matter behind the scenes what happens to these checks. Somebody could cut them in two, piece them back together again, the cat can wee on them, um, forge signature, doesn't matter. There's a whole range of facilities that they have to make sure they get paid on these things. And even to the extent in the old days, once a check had been uh, acted upon, they would send it back for your accounts. So in a, that actually puts, uh, puts sort of sleep to the proposition. Just because they're sending it back and saying it's no good, doesn't mean they haven't even, that they haven't already acted upon it and credited their account. And telling you, well, nothing's happened and it's no good, therefore keep on paying. So they're taking a double well, then they're going for a triple bite at the, the cherry. Second, second part. Uh, in Christchurch, so if, if one bank has already accepted one of your checks, does that not really set any precedent? Is it, are you finding that, that there's a particular bank that may accept somebody not accepting another? <laughs> okay, well, the uh, best way to answer that is that when we first started, the first week when the checkbooks went out around the 17th of April, the week after, um, 
many banks were quite confrontational. Many council, um, uh, should we say, bookkeeping departments um, were sort of openly hostile. I had NatWest legal department on the phone, um, HSBC legal department, uh, a guy called John at a very senior level in NatWest London. Uh, in between asking, well, how does it work? Or coming on the phone pretending that they're one of you, saying, oh, I just want some clarification. Um, they, by degree, um, seemingly become, I wouldn't say more accepting, but they've actually started to, to communicate a little bit. A vast majority sort of phone, and then as soon as I answer, they hang up. Uh, a lot of coming back and just simply saying that the, uh, the sort code isn't valid, or is this a, you know, it's, uh, it's not a valid bank. I had a conversation the other day with Halifax Building Society. This woman saying, I've got the client on the phone at the moment. She didn't tell me till the very end, so she was on for over nine minutes. Um, simply asking the same question all the time, were we regulated by the FSA? Are you a regulated bank? Uh, are you under the, the control of the Bank of England, which is no, 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 no. Then you can't be a bank. So I record all the conversations. Um, in many instances, they're, they're lying and saying to people, the check's been returned, refer to drawer. Or we've refused to clear it. Now, you know, why would we? So what we're doing in those instances is nailing them down, insist that they put that in writing, and just confirm the brief details. Who did you speak to? Roughly what day? Was it a man or a woman? Um, can you just yeah, clarify that because it's of a concern to you? But for when they start... Oh, and, and Westpac in Australia turned the ladies' check down recently and accused her of, uh, oh, what was it, sort of uh, various practices, and if you're trying to get money off Westpac Bank, especially uh, under the guise of these checks that may have been sold to you by uh, Richard of England. <laughs> Rich, <laughs> Richard of England and his lawful bank. He also goes under the name yeah. Roger Hayes. <laughs> so they got almost within that five or six paragraphs every single thing wrong that you could possibly get wrong by saying that it wasn't this and it wasn't that and it's unacceptable and therefore accusing her if, if she persists in trying to get, you know, uh, what do you call it? if it incurs a loss to Westpac Bank or if it includes a gain for her, she's basically involved in some sort of fraudulent activity. And just so we clarify fraud, fraud is a passing off, yeah? Uh, that's trying to dupe somebody or convince them to take a form of action on the belief that what they're acting on is the genuine article. So that's the copying of a Monet picture, um, copying a Bank of England note, uh, copying and making yourself look like this gentleman here, and then going into a bank pretending to be him. So no one can, can use that argument. If the sort code isn't recognized as being with any other bank in the UK, uh, we've got the name and the address of where we're supposed to be. We don't have the account number on. It's just a load of all eights, which doesn't exist. So um, it's stretching credibility for them to start making accusations that it's, it's fraudulent or it's uh, whatever else they want to say. So hopefully that answers that question. This chap here. So what exactly do we do if a check's not accepted? OK. What, what the, do we do? If the check is not accepted, there's two lines that it might not be accepted. The person that's the payee, so you make the check out and you send it to the local council and they send it straight back to you and there's nothing written on the check at all. Okay, so what you've done then is you make the, you're, you're basically looking then for the sections on the the uh, refusal for acceptance or refusal to present. So it's exactly the same whether they do it 
Or if they then put it into the bank and the bank then come back and they say they've refused it, can you uh, send another form of payment? So it's still those section 42 and 43 and then the bills of exchange act. Yeah, then you're making that notorial protest. So what you should possibly do, if it's the local council, if it's Virgin Media or if it's the payee directly that's saying it's no good, then what I would say to them is it's not up to them to decide. They must present it for clearing. And this is the thing. UK clearing is only a preference of the main commercial high street banks. The only people that can verify that there are funds in the account is the bank that it's drawn on, or the drawee. So they must present it to us. And they can either do it over the phone, electronically, under what's called the Deregulation Bills of Exchange Act 1996, which is a statutory instrument, I think that's sections... I think that's 72 and 73, alternative place of presentment and alternative, uh, alternative means of presentment. So all we want over the phone is several things, like RBS phoned up on Friday, could I confer? And then, well, it's RBS Lloyds, I think, in Scotland, and they said, well, yeah, can you confirm? And I said, we just need the four pieces or five pieces. Um, the date of the check, the amount, the name of the person, the check number, and I think one other, and you can clear it over the phone. Now, if they're prepared to play that game, it's much easier for them. Eventually, we'll have a section on the website where they can go in and look. Um, but other than that, um, it's very simple. The system is either sound or it isn't. There's no fudging it, it's no skipping and hopping and jumping and then putting your finger in your ear because you forgot to do it at the beginning. Their system states quite specifically that if it's a check on its face that looks good, then if there is money, however defined, in the account to back it, then they must accept it. And if they don't accept it, they need to say why, dishonor, tilt, finish, and if they refuse to um, present it equally, the same thing. Because presenting it to us is then the clarification to them that there is money available. And their way is 98%, 98% of all money is what's called bank book, check book, ledger, monetary unit of account, which is just the simple debiting of a fictitious ledger here and crediting of a fictitious ledger there. Okay, uh, that chap though is handled. Okay, so it's a, uh, it's a recap on what the checks can be used for and what they, they can't be. Uh, probably the best way to refer it as a debt checking facility or a debt checking service. The whole rationale from day one, it's on the front of the website, states that we are predominantly looking to facilitate this uh, alleviation of debt and this encroachment of this, uh, you know, this, this credit society that we've all been sort of scooped up in. So it's primarily for uh, arrears or debts or people that need a last resort because either their homes are in, in, in dire, dire straits of being possessed or repossessed, um, that the credit card accounts are going to end up taking them into a county court or their Businesses are going to be bankrupted because of non-payment of VAT or there are fines accumulating because of non-payment of self-assessment, uh, etc. So anything on the public side. A public side does include all the banks, all the councils, uh, all the car finance companies, all the insurance related matters because it's all part of the same web with the same spider. So they are not to be used, for example, like someone recently did with his, uh, I think his Barclay card. He usually has five to six hundred pounds a month to pay off on it, but this particular month he didn't. He had 19 pounds something in. So he sends a check for 19 pounds and eight pence, sees that it's cleared, and then finds out they closed his, his, uh, his card account. 
you know. So, but he didn't need to do that. You know, it would have been much better if he'd have done it in a month when he owed 500. Um, so the idea is that once you do that, don't forget, these are the, uh, this is the opponent that you're dealing with. You can't expect the high street banks under which we are, as I say, we are assailing them with their own ropes. You can't expect them to be nice and, and, and shall we say, kindly to us and expect all the same services before. If you're suddenly paying down your credit card and they're clearing it, let's say, and then the next Saturday you're going out and racking up four or five hundred quid in Pizza Express and TGF in Covent Garden. You know, it's sort of like taking the piss a little bit. So the, the, the main guidance is that when you're in the position where your back's against the wall and you're just about either to be taken to court or you have your home taken from you or, you know, parking fines which are just like, you know, 83 quid because you didn't buy a £1.50 ticket, then forget them, you know. They statutorily do not have a leg to stand on. Uh, but instead of going and fighting the whole thing, just pay it. So hopefully that answers that. Pizza Hell. Yeah, just, uh, just for clarity, sake, when somebody's joining uh, way back, um, if they call Bob Smith, um, do they put Bob Smith or do they put Robert Smith? Uh, it probably what's over on your, your, your birth certificate or your national insurance. So if you're called Robert, if you you know, if you were called Robert, is this for the account number? Uh, no, no, not so much for that, but it's for uh, for details on the phone when you join. Um, yeah, it's a good point. I'm speechless. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that <laughs> question. Yeah, so keep yeah, keep it what's on your birth certificate or stay with your birth certificate because we're operating, don't forget, there's two things we've done here. We've split your personality and we've we've created two personae. You're on the public side to stick it to them on the public and all this other, the re, is on now the private side. So you know, so if we're paying down the sterling on that sterling side, that's all public since 1931 <coughs> when you were, the, the, means of, the means of payment was taken away from you. So everything from then on is legitimate. Yeah, when we came off the gold act, or, uh, sorry, when we came off the gold standard between sort of 29 and then or 27 and 31. So that's why this is legitimate because they promised you a line of credit from that point. And they were going to issue that through the Bank of England, but you never got it, you know. So in effect, you're, they're at war with you, and you're there to pay off the, the, the national debt as they run it up on lovely uh, shopping malls and crystal crystals on the road in the cat's eyes, or you know, a, a, a five and a half million technical college that's been built up by you know their mates on the council, um, and so you're expected to pay for it. So public side, private side, a bit of schizophrenia involved, and wearing two hats. When you put that hat on, you're that persona. When you're the other, like everyone in here is acting now in private. You do whatever you want. You know, if you want to exchange you know, this for oranges, you can do. It's just, it's, it's our <laughs> private, <laughs> private. But once you get into the public domain, and this is the thing they are telling you, no more checks. You can't pay, you can only pay with a card. You can't pay with cash. You must do this. You must not park on there. You, it's all just one way. It's all coming at you and it's all running downhill. <coughs> okay, this chap here. Everyone in here must know what's going on with John Harris. Dead, isn't he? Yes. What security you got? People died for less than what you're doing now. What security? What did he die of? Do we know? Huh? What did he die of? Suicide. 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 Yeah. Well, all like so. Publicity. Are you protected? Are you okay? Publicity. Yeah. If they take him out, the pretend takes his place. That yeah. is the defence. Yeah. I'd, I don't know. No, I'd like to. I'd like to think so, but historically, 
Adolf Hitler said it in Mein Kampf, that the degree of heroism is always related to the degree of risk. So I'm not a great favorite of Adolf, but everybody should read Mein Kampf and find out the mindset it's banned in, in certain countries. Yeah, but it's a security yeah. Go yeah. The, the, the yeah, no, 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 no. What people have got to remember here, and this, this whole thing is predicated on, um, let's call it a hierarchy of beings that are interested in solving this problem. On the argument that, not that you propose, but the argument that states something could happen means you would never do anything. They've already, yeah, they've already won. No, th so they've already won, but therefore uh, you can't really march to that tune because one, then they've already won. You know, when I went into the Peter of England thing with the number plates, so many people said to me on that first day, well, I'll give you till, I'll give you till you get to junction 15 on the M6 before they pulled you over. Two months later, we're still driving around. It was only my own stupid fault driving into um, Stansted Airport with a camping car, going through the, the barrier to drop my, my girlfriend off, um, seeing how much it was to pay, something like 15 quid for, so I didn't have enough money, and then trying to get out, and the security people having to get the, the, the gate up for me, which possibly triggered it. And the problem is, we shouldn't have been going to that airport, so this is just a thing now. We told the person to book the flight from Gatwick, because they found out where the, the cheaper flights were. When they said to us, right, we've booked the flight for the time and date, okay. Oh, she pressed the wrong button at the end and it was from Stansted. So the only reason we ever ended up in Stansted was a mistake because otherwise the camping car would have been parked, we'd have gone in on the train and I'd have been off and out and another chapter would have carried on. So it's who and why these, these, these acts of fate <laughs> happen. And then there's also this thing called destiny. So I'm, not, I'm a believer in a very strong uh, protection and it's just something that I, I, I know and the last thing they want probably is me in their mouth, you know, and having to spit it out. So it's a good point, but um, yeah, we'll see. History will prove who was right and who was wrong. And as I keep saying, as long as I'm still standing here doing this, then the problem lies to their side and we will march down. And I have a commitment to change it, which is, it is it's incarnational eons in, in the build-up. And so there are lots of people, there are, there are not only people behind the scenes wanting this to happen on both sides of the camp, but also, should we say, extraterrestrially that have an interest in it. And that's the protection, because if you're relying on a, on a truncheon or a protective armor or a bodyguard, forget it. The Tibetans know of these, these energy paths, the Hindus, Anyway, so that's that's the direction it's coming in, and that's what will sustain it. And it's a belief. And don't forget, it's the belief in you that projects into here, which then projects back. So uh, eventually, you know, we could end up doing some quite miraculous things when we eventually start using our minds to do this, because a lot of mind experiments have been successfully showing of what you can and can't do with directed energy. So that's that one. Okay, that chap there. Yeah. Can you credit your account with work previously done? Uh, over what period of time? Uh, well, I worked for the fire service, so I've worked for it 26 years. Ye yes, I do believe that facility, but we, I'll have to tread a little bit carefully on it because I wouldn't like you to load in 26 years worth now right, no. um, but the the belief on that is the following if we are actually looking for example to charge the, your accounts with now for example from the time you signed the promissory note I would have to say from now on yes. because what's gone is, is possibly gone however let's look at someone who's 88 he just joined 
and he can't contribute because he's only on a pension and doesn't have any savings. Let's look at what historically and ancestrally that person has been ripped off to the tune of over his complete life of work. And don't forget one of the preemptive points in, um, in Weir Bank's ideology is you are now sitting, you're the last electron on the point of the pinhead. And everything behind there is those that went before <coughs> you, that died in the cold, didn't have medical treatment, didn't have money, lying in flea-ridden beds in London in the 17, 18th century. The whole pot, all the people who were exploited historically. And I've probably been quite involved in doing it in the past, as we all have, I'm sure. But, so there comes a point now where you look at that, and that is there for you, and what is there for, <coughs> you are the custodians of the global collateral accounts. So the planet isn't owned by anybody, it's owned by all of us. So everything on it is owned by all of us. So it's not a utopian, socialistic, communist ideal, it's, it's logic. So loading the hours for someone is, is something that we do encourage, or we can, and it's all to do with the fact how much you've been ripped off, but we can't do it erratically and we have to put a mechanism in it um, to get you like there, because the 88 year old is, is, is just as important as this, this young, uh, young person here, who's about what, eight? Twelve. Twelve? There you go, because he's all curled up. Okay, so a uh, question here. Hey, Peter. At uh, 150 people in this room, yeah. you know, at 30 pounds, if they put 30 pounds in the envelope, yeah. are you going to be, and if you keep doing this, are you going to be in a Caribbean island? In yes, I am. Um, that is the plan. You know, it's just, <laughs> a, Hang on, question. No. It's just no. a question. It's a very good question. So, I'll answer that. I, ju I just want you to make me believe. Right. Okay, so, have you listened to any, any of my yeah, yeah, YouTube course, videos yeah. in the past? Yeah, okay. no I haven't, sorry, no, just today. Okay, and so, what I've done since, well quite a long time ago, but since 2012 is really, um, it's almost like you could say, not setting the scene, but I've been out there trying to preach some type of gospel. And the way I've done it, and the things I've done, have been filmed. And the statements that I've made have been recorded by me and others. And so, I'd actually say that there are a lot easier ways, maybe, than of getting 35 quids. I used to trade on the stock market, for example. I don't know whether many people know, I was a full-time derivatives trader. I used to make 12% return a month. Yeah, and that's verified by the accountants and also by the Daily Mail who used to run my ad. And it used to say, three trades, three months, 300% return or your money back. Why did you stop then? Because I realised that it was, a very, um, it was a very pernicious and toxic environment to be operating in because you're only ever taking from people. And I had, shall we say... This was about 2000 and 2000, 2001, uh, should we say a spiritual awakening, which had come from the death of my father in 1996. So, there are easier ways for me, I mean I could sit down now and it would be much easier for me to do two scams. Let's start some sort of gold club. That would be a, a classic, but that's never come till now. Or the other one would be, let's try, we go and do some type of investment club where I show you how to put derivatives onto the market and um, how to trade it, right? But it's something that was a, a necessary thing for me to go through and, and learn because it's what brings the knowledge now. But, you know, uh, I lost something like one day I lost over about, I don't know, I think it was about 45,000 and I could hardly... I could hardly walk for a week, you know, and it was an immediate, it was like one hand of cards, gone. So I came back from it and then I rebuilt it in a different way because I couldn't leave when I was quitting. So I'm not here to go and live on an island anywhere. Um, I live very frugally. 
I lived for nearly six years in a camping car. The, the whole history of this is a very, it's a quite a sad story. So I wouldn't go into it because I'm in the strict instructions by someone not to go into it because it's, it's all a bit, it's a bit, yeah? So that's the point. And ultimately, uh, you can only recognize the truth. You can't be taught it. You can't be forced on it. And for everyone it says, oh, you know, it's a bullshit type scam and I'm going to get a banana colored Porsche. You know, really what? And, 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 and trick everybody. Can I just contribute yeah. to that? Yeah. The reason they're bringing these guys to the meetings, like they actually meet other meetings in the country, right? Instead of some name on the internet, right? You can look in his eyes. And the best way of telling of judging, so judging somebody yeah. my way is to look in their eyes. So <laughs> the only way really is to tell Yeah, exactly. Years. And you know, also I, hope, he, I really do hope I'm wrong. Here's a no I hope you, yeah. you yeah. I have, well you're not wrong because you haven't actually said really what you and here's the thing. This is the great problem with you and us. We're all here now, and really, I'd say probably, let's say there's 20% of the room who are, no, 40% who are very committed, then there's 20 to 30% they are not so sure, and then there's some people towards the end, and at the end, uh, when it, if it went wrong, they go, yeah, I always thought it was a bit too good to be true. Now, the commitment on the other side is so ironclad that they won't even bring up a topic like that you know, within their own ranks. And that's why they're, they manage to get done what they get done. There's no falling out of bed and going, oh, I'm not sure whether I want to do that. They're told what to do. They're told through the Bilderberg meetings, etc. This is the implementation. You're for Volvo. That's Fiat. That's Smith Klein Beecham. There's the pharmaceuticals. There's the food additives. We want that in place within one month. Go. Here's the HS2, we want that put in the UK. Okay, right, consider it done. There's no coming back with excuses and thinking, oh, well, I'm not so sure whether it's a good idea. They have to do it. And so this is our, this is our problem, that if we embraced it all without hesitation and just took a punt that look at what's the worst thing that could happen, we'd be home and dry within by my birthday in October. But it won't happen because people will wait. And with you, you go and talk to five or six people. They'll all be suspicious and they'll all go mm, and, 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 until when it eventually breaks, like every revolution or all the people who were in the resistance in France from 39 to 45, as my dad used to say, oh, yeah, you know, we didn't see too many when we were over there. But when the war was finished, the whole country had been in the resistance. <laughs> Yeah, but that's just the nature of people. They'll always hang back and wait and wait. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's how it's historically always been. And that's why every innovation, every, every, shall we say, major piece of progressive social reform has always ever come from the individual. Could be you or you or you. Never from a group. You know, Alexander the Great or Taras Bulba or... Stalin or Hitler or Pol Pot. Oh no, I shouldn't mention too many of those. But that's where it's all happened. It's always that individual that needs to lift it. And the faster, you know, the slower you go up through it, I always think it's like a, a pen going up through a custard skin. If you go up too fast, you don't take much with you. But if you go very, very gently, yeah, you can almost lift the entire. So maybe sometimes that's why these things are best grown slow, because if they go high fast, they'll probably burst fast. Hopefully that answers that one. Right. Um, now, tell me a process. A quick one. How long do we actually get? Because I've looked through, I've read the which date, I'm still not clear. Okay, this notorial protest is actually, um, uh, I think it's section 93. So, what it says is that you should make a notorial protest within three days. What if you don't receive it within three days? Well, it's whenever you receive it or it is made known to you. If it's over the phone these days, because in 1882 they didn't have phones, did they? Probably do. Um, and also it actually says there that if you just note it for protest, that is as good as the protest. As long as you do protest it. 
So the idea of the protesting is, is really just to protest it and close it out then. Uh, but I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, if the, uh, if the it's probably much easier to do if the payee sends it back. Well, they have to send the check back. Then, did they send it to the bank though? No, 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 it was the bank that sent it to me. And what they've done is it's um, Chuck and Gloucester. They've got, I've got the redemption off the of Lloyds. They turned around and said, right, write the check out to Lloyds and the account number. Then they've sent me a thing saying, you haven't got, um, it's not registered in the UK. Mm. And um, then they've asked me to send it to the C&G and my name. The yeah, account because it's a good point. You see what they do, they don't actually know what to do with the, the things. And so they say, send it to here, send it to there. Um, uh, for example, the other day I had Close Brothers Auto on the phone. There was a check there for, I don't know, 4,500 to pay off some, uh, some finance agreement. And she said that their local, that they bank with RBS, but RBS is something like, I don't know, 20 miles away. So they usually put all their checks through NatWest. So they put it into NatWest, and NatWest has sent it back to them saying, um, they won't process it because they don't bank with them, they only clear through them, and they'll charge them 15 pounds for processing. So otherwise, they've got to send it through to RBS. So she was phoning me saying, well, can you have a word with NatWest? <laughs> you know, so otherwise you're going to have to charge the customer. And so, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're in possession of these things. They're, can you imagine? It's, a, it's a quite a tight-knit organization. They've probably got a check up on every, every computer screen and every council, talk, ta <coughs> council office uh, going. Anyway, so hopefully answers that. Yeah. Uh, are we drawing down when we make payments? Checks pay checks out. Are we drawing down from the promissory note? Are we pay, or are we drawing down from our energy going into our account? You're actually drawing down. So the question is, wh when you write checks, what are you drawing down from? You're drawing down from the money created by your own bank within We Are Bank. So your account is in effect your bank. Yes. So it's a, it like a, like an onion skin. So we're bank is the onion, and all your layers are your banks. So when you sign the check for say forty thousand or twenty or whatever it is, that's drawing down on your energy promise of the one fifty <coughs> until it gets down to a stage where let's say you'd signed checks to the full extent and they've been cleared, yeah. and therefore typically over a 10 year period, you need to raise that back up till it's zero. Can we put in a second promissory note if we've got um, two mortgages? At uh, the moment, we don't go down the second promissory note, even though some people have done even as many as 10. <laughs> uh, because what it does is, it, it makes, look at the logic of what we're trying to do and if the bank are saying anything uh, untoward uh, about us, imagine having to justify this. Oh, well, okay, so you took, like, what you gave this person you didn't even know, who's saying that they could do X, Y, Z, and what, you've given the best part of uh, 1.5 million just on, on tip. How are they ever going to pay it off? So we have to, that's why it was done at about 150, because we thought most people over a 10 year period, you know, if you're earning 20, 25,000 a year, which we're allowing you to put your normal contribution <coughs> from your, your job in to pay it down. So the bank is an agent. Is, is everybody aware of that? Yes. Yeah. So we are acting as your employer, like an agency, like a Deco or Blue Arrow. So. We're charging out, or they're, like Blue Arrow, they charge 14 quid an hour and pay you seven. So if you're earning 25 grand a year, we're saying you should be worth 50 grand a year. You're keeping your 25, the other 25 that you're, notion, the 25 you're notionally getting, we're saying credit into to pay down your promissory note. Okay. And also then, when you do stuff that's on the private side, but you couldn't get paid for any other way, then those units are added to your 148. Okay. Uh, 
And then there are other things you can do. You can then eventually start spending off the 148. But that's only when we get the retail um, element going and the, uh, the cards. Uh, the other question, gentleman over there from the bank said that they do accept uh, with regard to mortgages. Um, my question is, uh, can we use the cheques to pay off our overdraft at the bank? Uh, uh, sort of a current account overdraft. Yeah, anything. Wait, just You've got to remember that anything from the banks <laughs> is higher than the government <coughs> in degree of corruption and entrapment. So you go, don't forget that governments require funding and banks pay to install governments. You then come under the government with a, a socially implied contract uh, to pay taxes in return for voting rights. This is this sort of implied social deal. So that means anything on the public side which <coughs> seems to be private, That's the right, bank yes. aren't private at all. It's, it's like um, privateers who used to raid ships as, not pirates, but privateers with a letter of mar issued by the government to cause trouble to the enemy. So that's what you've got. So anything on the public side, which is banks, insurance companies, HMRC, courts, fines, the whole thing, uh, parking tickets, police, Everything that's operating on that side, in effect, is fair game. Okay. Uh, let's chat. Hello. I've got loads and loads of questions, but one thing that's concerning me is you need credibility. Um, I'm listening to people in here who are saying, I've sent a check off, they've done this, what do I do? That, to me, should not be happening. If you are sending a check off and you have a checkbook in your hand, yeah. it's all right, coming up here, just signing these things getting a checkbook and then they're going off paying stuff you should know before you ever got that checkbook exactly what you're supposed to do if anything goes wrong not be turning up to a meeting going what do I do I don't yeah. know what to do okay this is this That's is a, madness to me that it this needs to be an awful lot okay. tighter than this it's a good it's a good point did everybody sort of hear that he said no. okay <laughs> what he was basically saying is that people shouldn't be coming up here so much now and asking well what do I do when this happens I've signed a check, I've sent it off, and uh, this has happened, what happens next? Is that sort of...? Yeah, that, that's madness to me. That's that. in, in effect. Do, that's now, not being responsible, that's not being an adult. Okay, right, so the point is, it's very true, and what he's saying is, and what we're trying to do is various things here. We are trying to make people understand the nature of money. We're trying to show them also behind the screen how the system works. We are trying to then get them to load up their own information on the website to, once they've written a check, now they have to post it and upload it and enter it in. We also then have the section, so it's all coming bit by bit, but we couldn't do it at the beginning because until about three weeks ago, We A Bank was me in a little room no bigger than here with a fold up bed and my, my bag at the side. So I did all the, you know, got the checkbooks ready, um, was doing the mailing, um, answering the phone, the whole thing. I, I, and, it, and, and, and if we'd have waited, I assure you, if I'd have waited to get either numbers of people on board, everyone would have said, you've got to be mad to try that. Don't do it until you've got this. Let's try and find a backer. Yeah, let's make sure this is happening and that. So it was really a case of throwing the eggs against the wall and now we're here. Mm -hmm. And so we will be able to tighten it up. We will be able to um, bring sort of, sort of more balance into it. But predominantly, yes, there's a lot of crazy people out there. There's some guy on YouTube, uh, one video he did a few weeks ago, yeah, um, quite funny. He says, I've got this checkbook here from Weir Bank. He says, I can't even, it came within two days or three days. I can't even remember why I ordered it now. <laughs> I've got no debt and I don't quite know what to do with it. There's another guy, uh, let's just call him Richie for now. Um, he's on the phone three times a day. How do, what should I do with this checkbook now? Um, I said, well, what do you want to do, Richie? He says, I haven't got any debt. 
And he says, but I want to get in some debt so I can get out of it. <laughs> Can I just see some. Listen, guys, I just say, right, the free movement, free man movement, sovereign movement, whatever, whatever it is you want to do, right, we're basing upon honour, right? To be free man, we're not children, we're not infants, right? We're acting as adults, right? You must, you, you're wielding a lot of power, right? Anyone who abuses it, I hope you burn in hell. Because there's people out there just now dying because of debt. I've known, I've known six people in the last three years kill themselves through debt, yeah? This is not a game. This is not as you can go off and buy yourself a new car or holiday in the sun, right? That's, that's, that's beneath contempt, right? This is about, bills of exchange are all about zeroing out debt. That's all you're doing, right? If you can do that, if you, with your, the power you have, can do something, can tr contribute to the wider world, help other people with their debts, show people how to do this, right? It's all about us helping each other, right? All it takes is, there's some lunatics out there, some criminals out there, there's some bad people out there, who will use this and to ruin it for everyone. But just remember that one word, once you, once you start playing this game, honour, you must not only just talk about, you must demonstrate honour, yeah? There's infants out there, how we deal with them will, will, will transpire. Peter? Yeah, okay. How do we, if we can Check through you. If we want to send checks through actions that we're acting sort of on the bank and we want to utilise it, we often receive checks. How about sending them through you? Yeah, it's 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 a good point because last week I received uh, oh, three money orders from people in uh, in uh, in Canada for about 149 sterling for each one, and they're all made out to Weir Bank. So there's a bit of a dilemma, but only at the beginning. And the dilemma is, well, what I could do is I could now credit those into the Weir Bank account as, as anything. Uh, but at the initial stage, it's the only thing we need is sterling to do what we can't do until we can do with our, our unit. Yeah? yeah. So. This is the paradox of what's this guy doing, you know? Sometimes he's got a bank, or he's set up this bank for people from a pub, from the, to pay off the public debt with the private side, but at the same time they're asking for sterling contributions. Because all the stuff out there that we need sterling for, and don't forget, there's not so much, um, I think last week, after the Nottingham meeting, I think there's probably... That meeting, just so that everybody knows, I think there's about £1,700 generated at that meeting. Okay? I, I, took, uh, I spent over, I think, seven, eight, 800 the following week in printing costs, paying for the IT support, um, trips um, from where I was to, uh, to uh, Liverpool, uh, a trip to Manchester. I don't have a car, by the way. I don't have a car. So I go everywhere on the train. So it's those things just to let people... I don't have a credit card either, so it has to be cash. So the point is... Um, what's the point? Yeah, it wasn't like that. It was just that if, if you... The Weir Bank, if we were using the bank, yeah. obviously, you know, we all get checks from different people at some time or other. And if we can use the Weir Bank instead of the other bank. Yeah, it's, a, it's something that will come, but at the moment we're too embryonic, you know, we're, we're not walking, but we're going to walk. And this is why we've got to escalate it and quickly. Okay, next, again, Feynman. Sort of a combination of uh, get out of debt free question this. I've gone through the process with them sending the three letters, <coughs> but with the tagline that we've got here, just pay it. Yeah. Should I, even though I've gone through the process and I seem to be out, sort of out the other end, should I now pay the debt off or not? It's, it's done, it's done. And well, no, what I would do is go the way you've been going. That could work and it hopefully will. Yeah. But if it doesn't, then just whack it with this. Right. Okay. Uh, and then just so that uh, we know, uh, I'll just answer this question for everyone. Uh, there's still only two people really involved mm, on the day-to-day -day issues. I'm sort of operating at the front end, that's feeling the phone, 
um, doing the questions on technicalities with the banks and all of that. And then there's someone, one other person, who works a full-time job at the back end, sorting out all the mistakes on the promissory notes, getting it all loaded up, making sure that the data's gone in, um, you know, 150 tickets a day may be generated that, why can't I log in? Why can't I? How do I join Weabank? So... You can't use that time, this month's time, to do that for you. Because people are writing down their time. Yeah, yeah, it. absolutely we can. But the problem is at the moment, you know, he's down in Gloucester Way. I'm up in sort of... See you. Don't cast away. Thank you. Thank you, huh? See you soon. Thank you. And uh, so I think that's probably about it. So then maybe the final question, and then that's uh, enough for me talking for a day. Yeah. Peter, so uh, when we pay with these checks, what if uh, the finance companies have got uh, secured the charging order on the property? How is that going to be? Yeah. Uh, so that the question is a charging. If there's a charging order on your property, um, we can't ever make anyone do what they won't do. For example, somebody could pay off their mortgage, let's say they actually clear it, but what we can't do is we can't get the mortgage company to contact the land registry to force them to put, you know, whatever they need to do on the title deed. Yeah? Huh? Sounds a bit strange. You yeah, so you would do it if you could, if you go that way. But what I'm saying is, uh, we just mentioned something about the land registry. So what you yeah. just said is, if you have any dealings with the land registry, don't address, <coughs> address yourself as Mister or Mrs. This. Call yourself the principal. If you're doing something important. If you're doing something that's important, not just phoning up to find out, you know, something general. So. Uh, Thank you for that, and that's about it again. Thank you.